we begin with a Fox News alert. President Trump ready to strike a deal on the Dreamers, but only if Democrats agree to a long wish list on immigration reform, including money to pay for his long promised border wall. Hello, everyone. I'm Shannon Bream in for Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. Some top Democrats are having none of it. Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi blasting the new immigration proposal as a non-starter. Kristen Fisher is live at the White House with more. All right, Kristen, what other demands are on the list? And I got to imagine after the president's meeting with, uh, quote, Chuck and Nancy at the White House, they're not too jazzed about this. Yeah, and you know, Shannon, we're talking about a list of 70 demands. They range from improving borders, border security to beefing up enforcement near the border. But at the very top of that last list is uh, securing funding and complete construction of his border wall. President Trump also wants Congress to stop sanctuary cities by denying federal funding. He wants them to hire 10,000 additional ICE agents and 600 prosecutors. He wants to end asylum abuse and chain migration. He also wants a new point-based system for green cards. Now, this is all in line with what President Trump promised repeatedly on the campaign trail, but it's very different, according to Chuck and Nancy, to what they agreed to uh, while having dinner here at the White House a few weeks ago. They put out a joint statement that reads in part, quote, this proposal fails to represent any attempt at compromise. The list includes the wall, which was explicitly ruled out of the negotiations. If the president was serious about protecting the Dreamers, his staff has not made a good faith effort to do so. So there you have Chuck and Nancy placing some of the blame, not just on the president, but his staff as well. Shannon. Okay, so we know the president has also been talking to Congress about something we thought was sort of dead, which is health care. What now? Is it ever dead? I don't think so, Shannon. <laughs> um, you know, President Trump is expected to sign an executive order sometime soon. We don't know exactly when, but Democrats aren't going to like it because it really just continues to chip away at Obamacare, at the Affordable Care Act. And according to the Wall Street Journal, what this executive order would do is it would expand insurance options options for Americans who buy coverage on their own or work for a small employer. It would also direct federal agencies to explore ways to loosen regulations and even potentially lower premiums. Now, keep in mind, this comes just three days after the Trump administration announced a new rule that would expand exemptions to the Affordable Care Act's contraceptive mandate and two days after President Trump said he called Senator Schumer to try to cut a temporary deal, deal on a health care bill. So basically, if we can do a one-year deal or a two-year deal uh, as a temporary measure, we'll have block granting ultimately to the states, which is what the Republicans want. That really is a repeal and repeal. So President Trump trying to cut a deal with Democrats on both health care, uh, tax reform. You also have this new immigration proposal. But so far, Shannon, not a big surprise. Democrats aren't having it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of recess time built in there on the Hill as well, which makes all those things more challenging. Uh, Kristen Fisher at the White House, thank you so much. Well, this latest health care push by the president putting some Republican lawmakers on the spot. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel is live on Capitol Hill. All right, Mike, what is next now in terms of addressing health care after the Senate has struggled so much with this in recent months? Well, Shannon, as you're well aware, several attempts to get to 50 yes votes on health care reform have come up short in the Senate. So you have President Trump reaching out to Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer to see if they can cut a deal. Fox has confirmed they spoke on Friday with Schumer saying the president wanted to make another run at repealing and replacing Obamacare and Schumer insisting that is off the table. The president talked about his thinking on Saturday. If we made a temporary deal, I think it would be a great thing for people, but it's really up to them. Obamacare is a disaster. The numbers are out. It's exploding like I said it would. Of course, the president talking about cutting a deal with Democrats tends to make Republicans up here on Capitol Hill at least a little uneasy. Shannon? Mm -hmm. Okay, so speaking of uneasy, what is the latest on the back and forth between the president and the man who is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations uh, Committee? Uh, it's gotten a little ugly. Well, that's right. There's been quite a back and forth between President Trump and Senator Bob Corker. And after they went back and forth on social media, Senator Corker went to The New York Times and complained about the president, including saying what the president says about other countries could take this nation, quote, on a path 
to World War III. And Corker added, I know for a fact every single day at the White House, it's a situation of trying to contain him. This morning, Kellyanne Conway from the White House fired back. It adds to the insulting that uh, the mainstream media and the president's detractors, almost a year after this election, they still can't accept the election results. They're, it adds to their ability and their cover to speak about a president of the United States, the president of the United States, in ways that no president should um, be talked about. Also today, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell talked about Corker saying, quote, Senator Corker is a valuable member of the Senate Republican Caucus. He's also on the Budget Committee and a particularly important player as we move to the floor on the budget next week. And he's an important part of our team. In other words, important in terms of getting the agenda done. Shannon. All right, Mike Emanuel, very busy man on Capitol Hill. Lots to cover there. Thank you so much. For more on this now, let's bring in Fox News politics editor Chris Starwald, editor of the Halftime Report. And Chris, I almost don't know where to start. <laughs> so let's start with that dust up uh, between Senator Corker and the president. This is, listen, one of the tweets that came out this weekend from the senator. It's a shame the White House has become an adult daycare center. Someone obviously missed their shift this morning. Listen, the president uses Twitter when he wants to. Uh, good for the goose, good for the gander. Well, look, you, you could certainly say the president had it coming, given the fact that he launched into a tirade against Corker, who had uh, given a more veiled criticism of the president. Basically, Corker was defending Rex Tillerson, saying that Rex Tillerson is one of the people that keeps, he said, our country from chaos. Uh, the president heard about that, didn't like it, and then goes on the attack in a very Trumpian way against Corker. Then Corker has a choice. Do I lump it and just take this and hope for the best, or do I respond? And he responded. And now he's embarrassed the president because what he's saying is the president's not in charge of his own administration. The president, this is sort of a regency where people like Tillerson and Secretary of State Mattis and others are really running the show, and the president's just tweeting and acting out. Okay, well, the president is going to need him. I mean, one of the key issues that Senator Corker has been front and center on is this whole Iran deal. And if the president decides this week to not certify the deal moving forward, this kicks this back to Congress, Corker obviously is going to be a key player in that tax reform. If they make another run at health care, uh, can the president afford to be on the outs with him? Well, look, you would, you would have to hope, we would hope for uh, every member of Congress, Republican and Democratic, that they would not let personal animus towards anybody uh, cause them to vote one way or another. What happens in Congress, though, it's not the actual vote, it's the process of the vote, and it's the favors, and it's the granting of the assumptions of good faith. If a, Cong if a member of Congress, especially a powerful, powerful one like Bob Corker, doesn't trust the administration, doesn't have rapport, the little gimmies that they need about when does a bill move, how does it move, how long do you hold it open, Will that provision be put in? Oh, could you add that language? Those kinds of things that he has control over, he's not going to be of charitable mind for him, and that can have big consequences for final passage. Listen, another heavy lift on the Hill, or this list that the president has put out of uh, working on something with regard to DACA to the Dreamers. Yeah, you give me these 70 things, and then we'll have that deal. He had this meeting um, with Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and there were a lot of people on the right who were not happy about that. When they came out and intimated there was some kind of overview or agreeing that they would work towards an agreement, they're now freaking out about what he's laid out. How much of this list and these demands from the president's side now do you think come as a result of backlash from the right, from the GOP saying, how could you possibly make a deal with them without including us? One zero zero percent, one hundred percent, Counselor. Uh, this is uh, Stephen Miller, who's sort of the last of the hardcore Bannonites uh, that's left in the inner circle at the White House. Uh, I would imagine this is very much his voice speaking out. Uh, this is a consequence, by the way, of uh, uh, Steve Bannon bucking the president on the Alabama Senate primary down there and bringing out uh, loud voices against the president. This is the White House saying, OK, we hear you. We'll kill the deal. So this is the death of of the of round one of the uh, these are young adults who came to the United States illegally as minors. This is the end of that deal. That's what this announcement is, because obviously Democrats aren't going to do a deal that affects some relatively small percentage of illegal immigrants and do it for all of the marbles. Now, maybe these elements show back up in a later comprehensive mm. immigration plan if Trump really wants to do that at a later point. But uh, for right now, the dreamer is no good. But we think about what we saw with uh, Nancy Pelosi, the House Minority Leader, when she was back home in her district, when basically she had a press conference that was taken over by people who are young people who are here illegally in this country who thought she wasn't doing enough. So right. do, uh, is there any incentive then for the Dems to say, 
say, I'll come to the table because I got to get something done for those 800,000 young people who would fall under the dreamers. I can give you maybe a couple things, maybe not 70 things on the list. This is going to fall probably. Tom Tellis, Republican senator from North Carolina, has got a bill on this, and there's a couple other versions floating around. But it's going to come down to essentially whether Tillis can get Republicans behind his plan, uh, which is essentially a pathway to permanent stat, permanent legal status, uh, and one assumes an application for citizenship for these people. Uh, it's a fairly direct trade-off about secu uh, security versus that. It's a more straightforward thing. It's going to be up to the Republican leadership to get this done. Uh, this. Is not doesn't sound like it's going to get worked out between the president and the Democrats. I, hmm. I don't see that one right now. All right. Speaking of which, we have this tweet from him now about uh, health care and working potentially across the aisle saying, I called Chuck Schumer yesterday to see if the Dems want to do a great health care bill. Obamacare is badly broken, big premiums. Who knows? Who knows? Do you think the Dems cross across, come across the aisle to help the president do anything with respect Who to Obamacare? Who knows whether the president can successfully inculpate uh, Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi into what is going to look like a very bad year for Obamacare recipients, people who were, of course, forced by, by uh, penalty of law into the program. Let's see whether the, I think the president here is saying, hey, Democrats, why don't you jump in the pool here? The water's fine. And their temptation, strong temptation, is going to be, no, 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 you go ahead and you, you soak your head. We will stay out <laughs> here and blame you for the disruptions in people's health and insurance and da 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 da. Soak the head. All right, we're going to have to take that Twitter, find out a little bit more about that. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Bye. California declaring a state of emergency. As we take a live look at some of the wildfires in Napa Valley, we will take you there on the ground. Plus, the latest on the Las Vegas massacre, police again searching the home of the shooter. As first responders described storming his hotel suite on that tragic night. Yeah, I got a piece of shrapnel in my neck and I grabbed it for a second. And it was already just pulled blood dripping off my hand. I was like, oh, my goodness. And I wanted to try to do more. Um, but my partner was worried because I was getting lightheaded at one point. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to stay and I'm going to help as many people as I can. again questioning the Las Vegas shooter's brother as the investigation enters its second week. Officers also returned to Stephen Paddock's home in Mesquite for redocumenting and rechecking, we're told. Still no word on why he would have opened fire on this concert crowd Sunday night, killing 58 people. Dan Springer joins us now live from Las Vegas with the very latest about what we do know. Hi, Dan. Yeah, hi, Shannon. You know, police are clearly frustrated. We talked last week about them putting up billboards and asking for the public's help, and now they're doing what everyone does when they can't find something. They are retracing their steps, going back over ground already covered just in case they missed something the first time around, and that's why yesterday they were out at uh, Stephen Paddock's house in Mesquite, Nevada. They were already there first time last week going in over that house, and they found 19 guns. Well, after talking to Paddock's girlfriend, Mary Lou Danley, they got a second federal search warrant, which was was executed Sunday. A local official said that it was just to photograph some items, but the FBI would not comment. Now, late Saturday night and early Sunday morning, police and FBI profilers did a second four hour long interview with Paddock's brother Eric, who lives in Florida. Eric flew to Las Vegas to have the killer's body cremated and handle his finances. He wants to establish a trust for the victims. Last night, 60 Minutes aired an interview with the first Las Vegas SWAT team to get inside Paddock's room at the Mandalay Bay where they found his body and all that ammunition. They said the gunman had screwed shut the hallway emergency exit door and they were worried about an ambush. It's like a deadly game of hide and seek because when you're the one hiding, you always know where the person that's looking for you is before they see you. I remember thinking, man, I wish I had my dog with me because, you know, it's nice to have him lead the team. Meantime, Jason Aldean, the country singer who was on stage when the shooting began, was back in Las Vegas yesterday. His wife posted a picture on Instagram. The couple met with victims of the shooting who are still hospitalized. The Aldeans uh, called them some of the strongest people they've ever met. And last night, parts of Las Vegas went dark for 11 minutes as this city dimmed a lot of the marquees around here in honor of all those victims. Shannon. All right, Dan Springer, thank you very much. Let's bring in Ted Williams now, criminal defense attorney, former homicide detective, and a Fox News contributor. Ted, good to see you today. Hi, Shannon. And it, it seems like such a stretch. The more information we get, the more confusing this seems to be. And I know for a lot of people, psychologically, we want to understand why this happened so we can find some kind of reasoning in this and, and maybe prevent it from happening again. But so far, these answers about motive seem so elusive. 
Shannon, they are very elusive. Uh, law enforcement out there in Las Vegas, uh, they are frustrated because what they're trying to do is to get into the minds of a madman. And so what they're having to do is to go back uh, and establish a profile of what this guy was like as a child all the way up to his 64 years of being on this earth. And that's very difficult. So what they're doing is they're talking to people who knew his family. We do know that his father was a bank robber and uh, considered a sociopath and uh, so they're looking at that from a hereditary standpoint they are also talking to also prostitutes I understand out there that he's been with uh, and they're talking to his brother they've kept his brother for many hours now talking trying to find out what what was the motive and, and we're learning a little bit more about him, too, because of this lawsuit that he filed a years ago against a, a different casino where he'd had a slip and fall accident. This 97 page deposition is very interesting to look into how he lived his life. It's very unusual for you and I. A lot of people say for folks who are not professional, but, you know, very in-depth gamblers. He lived at these hotels, lived at these casinos. He owned a bunch of hotels or owned a bunch of homes he didn't go to. Um, but he lived a life where he would gamble all day, sleep all night. He would walk around in pajamas, sweats, flip-flops. I mean, this isn't normal behavior, but yet everybody says, I never saw anything that would have indicated this kind of violence. Well, you know, it, it was very weird because when I heard that this guy was uh, losing or uh, playing uh, gambling for $1 million a night, uh, that's, that's just out of just weird and but he was alleged to have been doing this he as you said or uh, sleeping during the day or uh, gambling all night or uh, he was just a person that seemed to be on the edge they believe that he descended into some kind of uh, mental impairment uh, starting last year so they're looking at from September to October when he purchased 30 of the firearms that he had uh, it is a very eerie thing what is also interesting is this so-called lawsuit he slips and falls. now remember this is a millionaire he slips and falls, and he's suing for a slip and fall that uh, where he had minor injuries it just doesn't make any sense all right. Well, now we understand there could be some movement by families, victims here. Um, what is the legal liability potentially like um, for his estate, for the hotel, anyone else involved here? Well, Shannon, you being a lawyer, you know this. Uh, when it comes to the victims, I think that they have an excellent cause of action against the estate. Now, it is my understanding that they also want to sue Mandalay Bay Hotel. Well, I think they're going to have an uphill battle there because, as Shannon, you know as a lawyer, it's what the, uh, the hotel knew or should have known. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can come clearly close to saying that the Mandalay Bay Hotel knew that this guy was going to do the things that he did mm -hmm. there are any reasonable person under the circumstances. Yeah, a lot of questions about how he managed to transport all those things in. But maybe we'll get some answers on that front as we continue to look for motive. Ted Williams, always nice to have you. Thank you. Yes, my pleasure. Well, fast-moving wildfires tearing through California wine country, torching more than a thousand homes and businesses now forcing evacuations as well. We will take you there live on the ground. Evacuations are, 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 are kind of uh, number one at the moment. And if people feel like they need to leave, we ask that they leave. Uh, if they get ordered to leave, we, we, we tell them it, it's, not, it's not a time to think about it. Uh, it it's time to go. News alert the governor declaring a state of emergency as wildfires rage across California wine country. The wind whipped flames destroying more than a thousand homes and businesses and sparking evacuations all across the area. That includes hospitals. Claudia Cowan is live in Sonoma County to tell us more. Hi, Claudia. Hi there, Shannon. Well, this was an iconic dairy that folks would see on their drive into Sonoma. It is still smoldering, and we just learned about a dozen sheep did not make it out here in wine country and beyond. The size and scope of this fire is simply astounding. It stretches from Calistoga to the north to Napa to the east and Santa Rosa to the west. More than 50,000 acres have burned, more than 1,500 structures damaged or destroyed in an area that is home to hundreds of thousands of people wondering if they'll have a home to 
to come back too. Several separate fires just exploded overnight, starting with one 200 acre wildfire at about 10 p.m. to multiple fires that jumped mountain ridges and highways and prompted massive evacuations in Napa and Sonoma. We are now hearing hearing harrowing accounts of people grabbing their kids and pets and racing out in the middle of the night. In some cases, finding the road blocked by flames and having to double back to find another way out. The numbers are still coming in, but it's going to be bad. We're looking at a fire that's impacted, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of structures. Uh, we do know that there are structures that have been damaged or destroyed. We also do know that there have been civilians who have been injured. Uh, right now, firefighters are on, on all hands on deck, uh, kind of uh, uh, one team force right now, uh, trying to get some containment and also really getting out in front of this fire and evacuating people. The damage, especially severe in Santa Rosa, 54 miles north of San Francisco and home to 175,000 people. Flames engulfed at least two mobile home parks, as well as a Walmart and a gun shop, setting off loud explosions there. The flames pushed along by hot, dry conditions and punishing winds, gusts reaching up to 70 miles per hour. Evacuation centers are filling up fast. We understand some 20,000 people have been forced out of their homes. There are injuries, Shannon, as well as reports of residents who are missing. So this is a continuing story, very fluid. This fire burning out of control, zero containment. It's going mm. to be an air attack, and we'll have more details as the day progresses. Back to you. Yeah, we know they've been having a tough time out west for months with this. Uh, Claudia, thank you for the update. And now to another natural disaster with some progress being made in relief efforts as Puerto Rico tries to recover slowly now from Hurricane Maria. The governor says drinking water supplies just reached about 60 percent of the island, but that number drops to 20 percent in northern Puerto Rico. And there's still a long way to go when it comes to power. Only about 15 percent of the electricity has been restored. The governor also ordering an investigation into the aid distribution warning. If there is any funny business, any mishandling of the supplies, there will be, quote, hell to pay. President Trump talking tough on North Korea, blasting the last 25 years of what he calls failed U.S. policy. Ahead, the administration's latest reaction. Plus, the president set to make a big decision on the Iran nuclear deal this week. Kelly Jane Torrance from the Weekly Standard gives us her take. And I'm in for Dana today because she is heading to Dallas to moderate a panel with former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. And she will be live tomorrow from the George W. Bush Presidential Library. She's going to sit down exclusively with former First Lady Laura Bush. You don't want to miss it right here tomorrow on The Daily Briefing. President Trump turning up the heat on North Korea. The president tweeting this earlier today. Our country has been unsuccessfully dealing with North Korea for 25 years, giving billions of dollars and getting nothing. Policy didn't work. Rich Edson's live at the White House with more. Hello, Rich. Good afternoon, Shannon. And this, by the way, is only a couple days after President Trump said, while flanked by military officers and officials, that this was the calm before the storm. Both the White House and the president have refused to say what exactly he was talking about when he said that. The president has only said, we'll see. Meanwhile, Secretary of Defense James Mattis has said that the United States is pursuing and prefers to pursue diplomacy in the case of North Korea. But if North Korea were to attack, the U.S. military, he stresses, is prepared. It is right now a diplomatically led, economic sanctioned, buttressed effort to try to turn North Korea off this path. Now, what does the future hold? Neither you nor I can say. So there's one thing the U.S. Army can do, and that is you have got to be ready to ensure that we have military options that our president can employ if needed. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson has been leading what the administration calls a pressure campaign. It's pushing other countries to isolate North Korea diplomatically and economically, getting them to reduce or eliminate the number of North Korean guest workers in their countries. The United Nations Security Council has also passed sanctions against North Korea. China voted to support those measures, though it remains North Korea's largest trading partner. Even still, President Trump has publicly applauded the Chinese government for the measures it has taken against North Korea. Though President Trump did criticize his Secretary of State Rex Tillerson for wasting his time negotiating with North Korea. State Department officials have clarified that the State Department is not negotiating with North Korea. It has diplomatic channels, mm -hmm. according to officials, open to talk about the three American prisoners, uh, citizens who are in prison there, Shannon. Mm -hmm. Important distinction. Okay, Rich Edson live for us at the White House. Thank you, Rich.
Thanks. For more on the nuclear standoff with North Korea, let's bring in Kelly Jane Torrance, Deputy Managing Editor for the Weekly Standard. Good to see you today. Great to see you, Shannon. Okay, so we know that, you know, all these rounds of sanctions, um, we're told that they are paying off in many respects. These, uh, there are a growing list of countries who say that they're not going to do business with North Korea. They're cracking down on a lot of things that we don't think about. Apparently, the State Department has been asking for a list. What can we go after? And then going to countries and making specific asks about how they can um, get with a program against North Korea. It sounds like there's been some success on that front. There has a bit, and it's about time. I mean, we actually know that North Korea's economy grew last year, 2016, by about 4%. So clearly, this is a, a long-needed uh, you know, uh, effort. And it's very interesting. It's not just people in the State Department. I understand that Rex Tillerson, whenever he meets with his counterparts from other countries, he makes personal asks, as you say. And even Mike Pence, you know, when he went to Chile, earlier this year, he asked that they would uh, reclassify wine uh, as a luxury export and so make it impossible for North Korea to get in. He also asked that they get rid of some of their you know, diplomats there. And uh, sadly, that one didn't work. But it, it is a real sustained effort. And I think they have to keep doing this because you know, all of the generals say that no military option looks good. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is sort of the best way right now. I mean, North Korea cannot expand its nuclear program if it doesn't have money to buy technology, if it doesn't have money to buy fuel, and if it doesn't have money to uh, you know, get the parts and work on, on expanding. So we need to cut off their money. And it's, you know, China, of course, is the big one. But there are plenty of countries around the world that are doing business with North Korea. In fact, you know, recently in Berlin, they found out that a hostel, a Korean hostel, was sending money to the Kim regime. And in that case, our, uh, our diplomatic efforts were successful, and uh, Germany shut it down. It's interesting that the there's been a lot of talk about the diplomacy and how that's the way we got to go. But the president has tweeted there's, quote, only one thing that is going to work. And even Senator Corker, who he's in a little bit of a feud with right now. Um, but he talks about the fact that the U.S. intel agencies agree that right now um, diplomacy may not ultimately stop North Korea. This is also something, though, that he has said about the president on this. He says on the path to World War III, he's told this to The New York Times, he says he concerns me. He would have to concern anyone who cares about our nation. What do you make of that? I mean, it's his own party. And, but listen, it's somebody who is very knowledgeable about these things. I mean, the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Yeah, you know, Shannon, there's two types of diplomacy here. There's diplomacy with North Korea, and there's diplomacy about North Korea. Now, Bob Corker actually agreed with President Trump that diplomacy with North Korea is unlikely to work because intelligence agencies have said that Kim Jong-un is an insane man, and he realizes the only way to keep his regime going, because it certainly doesn't have the support of the North Korean people, who are starving. The only way for it to keep going is to have a nuclear threat that anyone who tries to get rid of him, uh, you know, will be bombed to kingdom come. And, and so I tend to agree with, uh, with the president on that one, but I worry that he's undermining the other kind of diplomacy that Rex Tillerson and others, even Mike Pence, are trying to do, and that's diplomacy with other countries to get them to stop working and helping North Korea get money for its bombs. Yeah, of course, Kim Jong-un does not want to stop his nuclear program, and I don't think any conversations we have are going to do that, but if we can take away his ability ability to expand it, if we can cut off his cash, then there's not really much he can do about that. All right, let's talk about uh, Nor uh, Iran as well, because there's an upcoming date, October 15th. The president can decide whether he's going to certify the Iran nuclear deal or not. He's done it a couple of times grudgingly. It sounds like this time he may not. Of course, that would kick this over to Congress, that that kicks in. They've got a 60-day window to decide whether or not to impose uh, regulations. We're hearing from a number of folks within uh, Iran that are saying, listen, if they don't hold up their end of the deal, if the U.S. doesn't, that they're not bound by it either. And there are a lot of people who are concerned about what exactly that would mean. Those who are in favor of this deal say at least it gives us some guardrails with them. We know what they're up to. Although others would argue we don't really. I mean, I would argue we don't either. It's, uh, it's very interesting. I have some cautious optimism on this. Now, now, Secretary of Defense James Mattis and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs Joseph Dunford testified last week in the Senate, and they claimed that Iran was in compliance with the deal and that the deal was in the U.S. national security interest. And I'm quite surprised that President Trump didn't go after them on Twitter because he has disagreed with them. And I think he has very good reason to disagree with them. We actually have no idea whether Iran is in compliance or not because the deal does not allow us and the IE, IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association, to look at nuclear sites or military sites. Now, there, it's, there's a way to do it, and what, what happens is there has to be intelligence that says something's going on at a military site, and then the IAEA has to request 
uh, you know, permission from the Iranians to look at that. And the Iranians have so many days <laughs> to respond. It's ridiculous. So we really have no idea whether they're complying or not. And just because we don't have evidence uh, right now doesn't mean they are. And I think given the history of this regime and what they have done, it seems pretty unlikely to me that they would give up on their quest for nuclear weapons. They're yeah, just not, it, they're not like North Korea. They don't like to brag about it because they realize that uh, they're going to have more like more luck getting a nuclear weapon if they keep it quiet. Yeah, it invites a lot of attention. And interesting, too, that the foreign minister, a spokesman for the foreign minister in Iran says the president, he's considering designating Iran's Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist group. And he says if he does, the reaction from Iran will be uh, decisive and crushing. So another thing to watch as the president makes these important decisions about Iran. Uh, Kelly Jane Torrance, thanks for being with us today. Good to see Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Rain soaking the Atlantic seaboard as the remnants of Nate head up the East Coast. An update on the weather just ahead. Plus, why Vice President Pence walked out of the stadium before the big matchup between the Colts and 49ers. Was it a stunt or not? Hmm. Meantime, we are tracking the remnants of Nate, now drenching parts of the East Coast as it heads north. In the Carolinas, tornado strength winds ripped roofs off buildings and damaged many homes, leaving tens of thousands without power. Early yesterday, Nate made its second landfall in Biloxi, Mississippi, dumping gallons of flood water on coastal resorts and triggering storm surges all along the highways as well. President Trump putting dreamers in the middle of his battle for immigration reform. The president telling lawmakers that any deal to protect the dreamers from deportation will have to include his immigration priorities, including funding the wall along the southern border. Corey Elons is former communications advisor to President Obama and a partner at Vox Global. Vince Colonnais is editorial director of The Daily Caller and host of Mornings on the Mall with WMAL. Good to see you both. Hey, Shannon, good to be with you. All right, Corey, so listen, we thought that the president had a deal. He had a nice dinner with Chuck and Nancy. Uh, but listen, when he laid out the other side of the purported deal today, this can't be something that they're really going to get on board with. It, what, is this any deal at all, or is the president, as Chris Steyerwalt suggested earlier in the hour, simply spiking the original, whatever the agreement was? Well, th clearly the White House was really busy over the weekend, and not only did he disappoint Chuck and Nancy, as we're calling them now, but he also disappointed probably his Republican leadership and has set them up to fail again. It is shameful that we're doing this deal on the backs of the dreamers who know nothing but this country as, as their own and who deserve to be here and many believe deserve to seek a path to citizenship over 90% of Americans and 63% of Trump voters. But here's what's happening. Uh, the, the president just this weekend has put this on the desk of the leadership and, and, and the House and the Senate. They all say they're gonna take a look at it, but it is absolutely shameful that we're here at this point. They deserve to stay here, they deserve to be here, and this is not the time to talk about comprehensive immigration reform, which is what uh, Senator, uh, uh, the senator from Texas said just, uh, just today. This is not the time. But Vince, is this the time? Because there were a lot of folks who were worried on the right, thinking the president had given away you know, the candy store to these two and making some yeah. kind of deal. Do you come with a big over ask like you often do when you're you know, bidding on a house or negotiating a contract and hope that you get some of these things? Let's not forget who has all the leverage here. It's President Trump. This is a huge deal. This DACA uh, decision to basically get rid of this program by executive fiat and hand it over to the Congress and say, hey, make it law, will come with stipulations. Clearly, President Trump wants things. Chuck and Nancy knew that when they left the meeting with him. And now he's given a list of 70 items that he thinks are on his wish list. Does, he, does that mean he's going to get every one of them? Certainly not. But it definitely puts this much more in the in the trajectory of something that conservatives will like. And here are a couple basics, mandatory E-Verify nationwide, ending chain migration, uh, and of course, wall funding built into this. It's hard to see how anybody could oppose that particular plank. And, and now you've basically got the president saying, I'm going to give you this Dream Act or some version of it. And in return, I want a couple things. I think Democrats are scared to death that they won't be able to get DACA recipients the protections that they've been promising. Well, and we saw, as we talked a little bit earlier about the backlash that House Minority uh, Leader Nancy Pelosi faced when a number of them confronted her, uh, feeling like she's not doing enough for them. So we'll see if that pressure from the left works or from the right or either or both. In the meantime, another hot topic we want to ask you about, Vice President Pence walking out of yesterday's Colts 49ers games after some players uh, took a knee during the national anthem. The vice president tweeting, I left today's Colts game because President Trump and I will not dignify any 
any event that disrespects our soldiers, our flag, or our national anthem. The president then added, I asked VP Pence to leave the stadium if any players kneel, disrespecting our country. I am proud of him and second lady Karen. All right, Corey. Uh, a lot of folks think that it's fine that the players do it. This is a First Amendment issue. They can get out there and speak and grievances. Um, so why the media backlash against the vice president for making his own statement? Well, what, what we know about this president, about this White House right now, is they are the master of distraction. And this is one more thing that's distracting us from real things that we need to be talking about right now. We already know, based on the conversation on yesterday during the game and then what we heard on this air this morning, that this was premeditated. It was set up. For what reason? For what purpose? Here's the thing that VP Pence, Vice President Pence, and those football players have in common. They both exercise their constitutional God-given right to speech through mm -hmm. the First Amendment. That's what happened. And so the fact that we continue to come back to this over and over again is, is, is very disappointing. And it's one more way that the president in this White House continues to divide the nation at a time when he really needs to be bringing us All together. All right, Vince, if that's, if that's true, why reopen this wound? If it was calculated, as some say, by the president? Well, this is about emphasizing what's important to the United States. Forget, remember what the president's supposed to do, and the vice president in this case. It's not just to set the policy agenda for the country, it's also to honor our institutions, and in this case, to honor the American flag. You have week after week NFL players who've disrespected the American flag. You have a vice president who knows, as he's going in there to honor Peyton Manning, by the way, who they're retiring his jersey in Indiana. This is the former Indiana governor showing up. He knows to expect that players may take a knee here. So he's got to make a decision with the president, what do I do? And his decision was, I'm not going to honor the players who dishonor the flag. So he walked away. And if you want, you can call this a PR stunt or whatever you want to call it. The reality is it sent an important message that the leaders of the country respect the flag and believe it should be respected in all forums. This is a serious statement, mm -hmm. I think, by the White House, one that should not be cast aside as frivolous. It's important to a lot of Americans. Well, we well, respect Shannon, both of your, we're going to leave it there, but we respect both your opinions. And thank you for joining us on these hot talk topics today. Corey and Vince, please come back soon. Thanks. All right. Movie mogul Harvey Weinstein fired by the company he co-founded. How Hollywood is reacting to accusations of sexual harassment against this Oscar winning producer.